teach master of public policy, master of public administration, and PhD programs with about 450 students. And um, we have, we prepare students that go to work in public service broadly construed, including government and the nonprofit sector and um, federal consulting. So if you have any questions about graduate school here, let me know. But the immediate issue is that we have been partnering now for a couple of years. Is it three years? I don't even know. Time flies. The older you get, the faster time flies, I swear. Anyway, with REI systems uh, to have these grants management uh, practices. And the point is to help support a community of practice to share promising practices or to share complaints and to learn from one another. And so it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff, Jeff Myers was going to come up here and Ian will introduce our speaker today. And uh, it's my pleasure to have Jeff join me up here. And welcome. Thanks very much, Kathy. Um, I see a lot of faces I recognize, so many of you have kind of heard some of this before. Let me actually share a couple of new pieces. Um, the first is, if you are not aware, uh, George Washington University RAI Systems and the National Grants Management Association collaborate on an annual survey of grant managers. Uh, both at the federal level as well as the state and local level. If you have not seen it, please let me know. We will get you a link to the survey. It's actually about to go out in, a, in a kind of a weekly uh, uh, email uh, from the National Grants Management Association. But we anticipate that in January we'll have an event like this, except there will be a, uh, a couple of folks from George Washington, including Kathy, talking about the survey results and analysis, and then a panel of folks. Uh, our target is to have somebody who's kind of grants policy from the uh, Office of Federal Procurement Policy, as well as a federal grant manager, as well as a state grant manager, to kind of talk about what the survey results mean and what they think are some of the ways the grants community can succeed. Uh, so please do respond to the survey. We uh, find that it's more useful if there's more input. Um, second, I want to just tell you, uh, REI works with a variety of grant making agencies and there's one thing that we're kind of in the middle of now that I think I'm excited about and perhaps you will be as well. We're kind of going across a number of federal what are called small business innovation and research grant makers. Uh, and those are folks, essentially federal agencies who provide a portion of their grant uh, funding to small businesses to promote both uh, some mission impact on the agency mission, but also some job growth and uh, some, some business growth for small businesses. Uh, and we're going to be doing kind of a review of what the best innovation result was for each of those that's been commercialized and how they did that, how they selected the grant, how, how they found and, and, and attracted the grant applications, how they selected the grantees, what kind of technical assistance they provided. So it's something where I think it'll be interesting to a lot of folks, not just perhaps those focused on small businesses, but those who are interested in innovation overall. Um, but let me uh, uh, stop uh, uh, with that and, and uh, introduce our uh, speaker. Uh, our speaker is Mike Curtis, who is the director of grantsolutions.gov. And just as background, like a lot of uh, kind of organizations that succeed in shared services in the federal government, when I say a lot, that's a little bit tongue-in-cheek because there frankly aren't very many. Um, Michael has started with a grant program at the Administration for Children and Families, and it has been so successful both in effectively administering grants and in working beyond its own borders to interact with a variety of agencies um, that it has been named a center of excellence and essentially a shared service provider, uh, not just within HHS, but with more than 10 cabinet agencies and a number of independent agencies across government. So he's got, I think, some real valuable lessons to share and I encourage you, and he's asked that you feel free to suggest or ask questions as he goes along with his presentation. Um, just by way of background, Michael's also a little bit unusual because he's worked for not just one federal agency, but he's worked for uh, the Air Force, the Department of Transportation, the Food and Drug Administration, and now, of course, for the Administration of Children for Children and Families. Um, he is a recipient of the President's Quality Award, so he's recognized not only for the success of his organization and agency, uh, but for his success and his contributions, contributions as an individual. So, Michael, we'd thank, like to thank you very much for coming and sharing your wisdom with us, and look forward to your, uh, to your presentation. Um, one last comment, which is there are a number of folks who are online, and they may not be able to hear you when you're asking a question unless we get that microphone to you. So if you do have a question, Point her out, Michael, you can select whoever it is. I'll, I'll play Vanna White and carry the microphone to the person. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to share with you how we're partnering with 1,500 national grant programs to deliver an enhanced grant system. Uh, we're going to talk about who Grant Solutions is a little bit. And as uh, uh, Jeff mentioned, we actually started as a uh, single agency 
and we just started reaching out to other partners. Hey, would you like to work with us on this? And we did it one after another after another, and now we're partnering 1,500 different uh, agencies. And we wanted to share some of the lessons we learned through the partnership. There's lots we still have to learn, but uh, there's some we've learned too, uh, good and bad, I think. And then, given that we have a collaboration with 1,500 uh, programs, how are we planning to leverage that uh, collaboration future to sort of deliver the next generation uh, grant services? So Grand Solutions is an award-winning uh, congressionally designated center of excellence. Uh, we're a grant management service provider that provides grant services uh, to voluntary partners across the entire grants life cycle. And our passion is delivering uh, value to American people. And to us, that looks like making our partners successful with their mission. And feel free to ask questions any time here, because otherwise it might go to sleep out there. So when I say Grand Solutions is a partnership, when I say we Grand Solutions, I don't mean me or a couple of people I work with. It's all the people here and, and a bunch more uh, from CDC, uh, uh, IRS, and other agencies in Treasury. We have the Department of Transportation, number of agencies there, uh, State Department, uh, so it's sort of list, EPA, a list of who's who in government, HUD, and what have you. And uh, I don't want to list them all. Uh, grand Solutions by the number, we do 80 billion plus in grants. Uh, 10 cabinet level independent agencies, 100,000 plus users, 70,000 uh, annual award actions, uh, as I mentioned 1,500 programs, and 10 plus years of partnerships. So that's 10 years of you know, people uh, wanting to join and work with us. And no one has to, to come join us. They join because we add value to their mission, which is different than maybe most government agencies are where uh, someone's told they have to go join the share service. We, by design, made it that only people that wanted to come with us would be with us. I see my friends at uh, USDA, for example. Uh, OMB once asked you what, before they built the system, do you want us to tell the uh, USDA to join? Well, no, absolutely not. If they don't want to do it. They want to build their own system. I want them to build their own system. I don't want them to be anyone to be forced to join us. So we cover the full life cycle. So that comes from forecast all the way to close out, every step in between. And people think, well, that must mean like a system or something. And we do have a module or service for every system. But we're also strategic advisors to grant agencies. So when a new agency is created by Congress, we'll actually go part of that agency. We'll give them their terms and conditions or help them develop. We'll help them develop their uh, grant policies. We'll help them set up the entire business process. And for small agencies that can't, uh, don't have economies of scale enough to actually have a grant office, we'll actually do the entire grant process for us, not just the system, but the entire grant process, so that all that an agency has to do is just enter a user ID and pass to the end and approve the grant uh, award, and it's done. Um, other thing is, is if an agency, uh, for example, has enough grant staff because they're large enough, but they have surges, we'll actually provide staff to handle surges, for example, one of our partners needed a thousand doctors, and so we went and recruited a thousand doctors to handle all the grant panels. Administratively <coughs> handled that, and then helped them through the process to award the grant. I'm, I'm curious whether or not the agencies that have already got an established grant process, but then decide they want to partner with you, perhaps their technology is out of date or something, must they change their process significantly? That that seems like that's continually a hurdle when someone's offered a chance to kind of adopt a new system? Well, well as it turns out, what we find is about 80% of what a grant agency, about 80% of what a grant agency does is common between grant agencies because it has to follow uh, legislation and OMB process. And about 20% is unique. We have hundreds of menu selectable items to get thousands of different uh, combinations of what a uh, partner can do. So most of what we have, because for 10 years we've been investing you know, uh, millions of dollars a year can just be selected to have whatever kind of format they want. Something as simple as a notice of award, uh, agencies come in, they all have their own copy of a notice of award. And so uh, the way the system's designed, it doesn't automatically put a name on the top and you hard code it. You just select the name you want and you put that on the top. And so we started with everyone having a different notice of award, but it's less expensive for a partner if they use a standard one. So most of our partners now are, even though they came in different, or standardizing on a standard notice of award because it, it saves them money and at the end of the day, they don't really need to have different awards if it costs uh, revenue. But then there are a few that have some sort of legislative or internal political reason why they want to keep it. So we <coughs> provide the opportunity to solve their mission problem and we provide the opportunity for savings of, uh, of a commodity type service. 
depending what makes their mission best. So we do this mission aligned solution with an a la carte type solution. So uh, so many shared services, you get what you get, it's out of the box and then you have it. With our system, you can actually pick whatever you want. So a person can just purchase one module or one service from us or the end-to-end -end entire process. And the partners choose whatever adds the best value to their mission. <coughs> so uh, we enable partners to actually leverage what they, I'm never stay in front of the microphone here, what, because we have people uh, remotely, uh, we allow partners to do it. So a partner has to say tens of millions of dollars invested in a program system they do analysis with. We have standard interfaces that come from the grant system and go to the program system. So the program system is now able to, uh, to maintain that investment and get the information they need and we have standard interfaces that take the information back that a grant system needs. So what are the lessons learned through partnerships? Well, it's a complex grant world. You know, we have in multiple agencies, thousands of programs, myriad of IT systems, and financial and human capital constraints. So there's a community of multiple constituents, uh, and the goal is to make sure all these are successful. When it's a voluntary program, you have to make sure everybody wins or people don't come to the table. So you have the public, all being Congress, they're looking for transparency, accountability, uh, they're looking to make sure that they're getting a good uh, return on their investment. The grantees, uh, they're looking like anyone that fills out a, a tax form every February that, or every uh, April. They don't want to have to, uh, to fill that out, they don't want to have to do all the paperwork they have to do. So they want us to simplify their life so they can focus on delivering the mission that they have. And the grantor, they're seeing staff reductions, so they're looking, how do I make my life easier in terms of the burden that I have? And they want to say, how do I improve the outputs of the programs that I have and the outcomes from the programs that I have? So we're seeing uh, uh, challenges facing the grant community with the partners we partner with, and fraud to do is with your staff gives less opportunity for oversight. Uh, wasteful IT strategies. We have systems of people that in agencies that are even today investing tens of millions of dollars in new grant systems when in fact uh, there are existing grant systems at USDA or us that can actually do that grant process uh, with no investment and will probably do more than their current system or the new system they would develop uh, does. And currently programs have a limited insight into uh, uh, grant programs. So they shouldn't be investing probably in a grant system so that's something that exists. If they're going to invest, that would be investing in program outcomes for their, uh, to get more insight into what uh, is being delivered. So when programs join us, uh, we see sort of a three-phase thing. They come in initially for something happened and some major event occurred and they go, I need to have a grant partner. And when they do, they look at us and they see that uh, we're sort of the natural choice for them. Been in this business for 10 years, we have a great relationship with our partners, and so they, they typically use us. And so for the first uh, year, they're just learning to put a standard process in place, transparency, accountability, those kind of things. Uh, because they came from many different systems or a paper process and no real structure. So now the grantee has a unified experience. The second year, things are going smoothly because they've learned the system, they've done it one year, and they go, well, how can I be more productive? So what about these manual processes that I did, can I now get rid of? But because Manually, there's things that require that you don't have to do it in an automated fashion. And then they also ask, well, even if I still have to do it, can you automate those processes? So we start working with them to take end processes down to two processes. And then when they're more efficient, they start thinking, well, what about the outcomes of my program? I'm investing tens of billions of dollars. How do I make sure I'm getting the outcomes that I want? So it's really falls those uh, three phases. The first year or two is the client phase. Most of our partners are in the middle days of how do I be productive, and then we have a uh, maybe 10 percent are saying how do I impact outcomes. Excuse me. My question is, uh, thank you. The ROI, because that to me is uh, I'm a program evaluation person. That's really hard. So, do you have some kind of mathematical formulas or something that you use? Uh, I'll actually chat a little bit about okay. ROI then later. Come back. Sure. If that's okay. okay. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Uh, so what we find is that uh, uh, partners need to establish uh, consistent agency processes to save money. That is, 80% of what happens in grant agencies is the same, and by grant agencies using that same capability, 8%, that's where the cost savings came from. Um, the duplicate IT system, agencies uh, can take the uh, redundant IT that they have, get rid of that, 
actually begin to invest those same dollars, because agencies have a fixed budget, in something that adds additional value rather than the commodity type services. And we create a common grantee experience. When we come to agencies and they have many different systems and many different processes for grantees, that's not good for the grantee. So we're able to standardize the process for the grantee and the agency, and where the departments uh, use it across the entire department, some of ours do, that's standardized for the appointment. And where we have multiple departments in different, uh, across the government using it, that gives that grantee experience in all these different departments when they show up. And there's a real value to that. That being said, one size does not fit all. Uh, we see admission objectives are very program specific in the grants, not like uh, contracts. Program sizes are very different. So what a small size program needs and what a large size program needs is dramatically different. Uh, we see legislation and policy be very different. Uh, grants programs grew from things that people wanted to accomplish, not from the bottom up, and therefore they're all very different. So in terms of unique mission requirements, we serve CDC. And what CDC requires uh, working with a very advanced uh, university, one of the universities on, uh, I don't know, biomedical research, is very different than what our Head Start partner needs for a native Alaskan uh, tribe in a very rural part of uh, the Arctic. Any, any questions here? I don't mean, you're going too fast. So it, it strikes me that you are in a unique situation to be able to look across not only programs but federal agencies. And it, it makes me wonder whether or not, you know, I think of the problems Equifax have faced recently, although you might face them more as opportunities. Do you, are you able to do analytics or share information across programs or agencies? And, you know, the one I immediately think of is maybe there's a fraudulent applicant, or maybe they're just financially unstable, and they're perhaps applying for grants from three different types of agencies, and maybe one of them discovers that they're fraudulent or, or perhaps again just financially unstable. Is that information something where you can either in advance predict or, or do analysis after the fact and kind of do things across agencies that an individual agency might not be able to do it for itself? Uh, we, we can do that some. One of the best sources we find for that is uh, when we run artificial intelligence machine learning against the data is the audit center. So we pull the data down from the Kansas City uh, Central Audit uh, Clearinghouse. And so every audit that's done on every grantee, we pull that in. And we run data against that, you find some strange things. People that have traveled too far, a high relative to the amount of grant they have, that's often fraud. I mean, not if they're in Guam or something, you'd expect they'd have to spend more for travel, but if they're in the same area and they're doing more for travel, when people file a voucher with us and it has too many zeros at the end of it, that's probably fraud because taxes don't cost zero zero. They really cost some odd amount, hotels cost some odd amount. So there's a, if people are collecting the money too early or too late, that's a problem. Too early to probably fraud because it should be collected over the time and services. Too late, they're probably not executing the program well. So there's a whole host of things that you wouldn't think about uh, that actually you can uh, use to analyze it when you run the machine learning and AI against it. So mission success is achieved through balance. That is consistent agency processes, reduced duplicate IT, and common grantee experience. That's what saves money. But uh, in order to have programs actually join you, you have to accommodate varying program size with an a la carte type menu. You have to allow for differing regulations with configurable software. And you have to have unique mission requirements, which we talked about, the ability to uh, send data to and receive data from program systems. So the, there are basically three models that we see that people are uh, selling. We have uh, the commodity model, and most people believe, or many people believe, that the commodity model is the, uh, is the right solution. That's where one size fits all, and therefore you save money, and that's the model you ought to use. Uh, what we found uh, is that the collaboration model actually is about half the cost of the commodity model. And the reason is, is the commodity model meets 80% of what people need, but what happens is 20% is not meant, which means the agencies have to have another system of their own. And another other system of their own then costs as much as it costs them for the commodity known models that essentially doubles their cost. And then on the other end, we see the, uh, another camp that says, oh, we ought to have an agency-specific model because we have agility, we can meet our business process. And what we found is that the collaboration model uh, is much better at meeting the agency process, and it's also much more responsive than an agency-specific model. And the reason for that is, is that if the agency receives funding, First off, they have to put a contract in place, which can take a year or more. And then they, even if they have a contract in place, 
typically agents have to put a task order in place and they have a, a year or two backlog of things they need to do because they have to keep a uh, staff busy at a certain level. But with the economies of scale we have in collaboration, we have development teams on hot standby that can immediately address requirements. So the day a partner walks in with funding, they don't have to wait two years in their cycle to have it come to the top of their list. There are people on hot standby who can do it. So it's actually dramatically cheaper in collaboration and dramatically more responsive in collaboration uh, than, uh, than either one of the two models that people generally think of. So, so our experience is this collaboration is the secret that works in, in uh, delivering grant services for our partners. Any questions on that? Is there a, can you cite a specific example uh, that, that uh, can illustrate, I think, the collaboration uh, using one of their partners as an example? Well, I, I think that uh, uh, basically every, uh, every day a partner comes in and wants some kind of service for us. We have a, a constant stream of those. And, and it can be very, very simple. I, I'll, I'll pick a, a favorable sample. Uh, Department of Transportation, the, the, maybe one day she said, I need to have a political person that, that, want, that will approve all of my grants. And so uh, we immediately, uh, that, that they, they approve us, and that day we have somebody working to put that in in a couple of weeks. Whereas if you're at a large agency, I don't want to pick on any particular agency, if you're at a large agency, there's typically a two-year backlog in the IT department or whatever, and so uh, they'll say, let us put that on the list, and a couple of years from now, we'll be able to work on that. And, and the way we do that is we actually staff according to what the average revenue is for uh, partner stuff, and we staff for what the revenue is for the uh, continual improvements that we make to the system. And so the priority always goes to the partner funding, which is why uh, they can get things done instantly in collaboration model versus waiting a couple of years, and uh, we still have the same amount of work done in a year on the general improvements that we do. Michael, it, it seems like that's kind of an example of the proximate cause as to why, <coughs> excuse me, one agency decided to work with you, which is, you know, we need to have a change made and we can't wait two years. It's, it's politically imperative. I wonder what are other examples of kind of why an agency might just kind of reach the limit and decide they need to come and work with you or with another. You know, I've always kind of assumed it was, well, we've got this 25-year-old technology and the COBOL is no longer supported. It's dying. We have to get off this burning platform. Maybe we'll come choose you. But I'm curious as to kind of what, what are the mix of motivations and what are kind of maybe the strongest ones that most frequently lead an agency to come and join you? There's always some crisis that they have to address. And so when they come and look for a grant system, there's some pain external driver that's, that's having them look for that, uh, that opportunity. And it could be a new agency uh, is created. And so they have to get some, like when they created the healthcare agency, they have to get them done right away. They went to other uh, agencies and said, hey, can we partner with you? And they said, yes, we have the two-year cycle and we'll have you up and started on your work in just two years. Um, and we said, we will have you operational in two weeks. And we had them fully operational in two weeks. And so the, the, the moral of the story is there is that when people need a solution, uh, virtually everyone joins us, but uh, that's because we have the, the huge cost savings dramatically more than commodity, and then we're very responsive in terms of, of time. But nobody has ever, in my uh, knowledge, joined us because they had, did a cost analysis that they needed a, a system. There was some external driver that uh, had to look, and when they looked, they, they joined us. But collaboration is the key. You know, all the stakeholders at the table like this meeting right here where we start sharing ideas. And it's not just an economy of scale. When you bring 1,500 grant programs, there's a lot of smart people and a lot of uh, intellectual energy that comes to make things uh, better. So it's, the, uh, it's also an ability to get things done. Sometimes when you get things done in the government grant process, it takes forever. But people that voluntarily collaborate are able to be very agile and, and be very quick in being responsive. <coughs> so looking forward, uh, we're seeing many of our partners have a lot of uh, uh, drivers. So the Uniform Grant Guidance is trying to make uh, grants processes more standard. The Data Act trying to make them more efficient. Dawn Act trying to close out Management Act for Technology. Grant Act about grant modernization and Great Act and a host of others. So. Uh, when I'm on the weekend and I have nothing else to do and I can't fall asleep, I read all this stuff, and so I understand <laughs> what this all is. 
And then I figured out how to operationalize it. So partners come to us and they want to say, well, how do I make this operational? Because they may not have time to always read this or they may have read it, but then don't know how to make it operational. So that's the value we do is we collaborate with them both to understand it and to come up with operational solutions to operationalize these uh, policies. So one of the things our partners are asking for is to reduce the grant fee burden, so a better experience. And so we're trying to do that in a number of ways. An example is we're standardizing data elements for notice of award, progress reports, and financial status report. And what that allows us to do <coughs> is to send electronic files over instead of having to do manual filing. Uh, and so what happens is we're uh, being in conversations with the MIT who gives uh, 100 plus universities a, uh, a software. And so we'll standardize that data interface with them. And we're working with, uh, back to conversation with REI, to use that same standard to work with the states that, that they serve. And so uh, that will allow the, the uh, interfaces for these thousands of grants and tens of thousands of grant works to be going back and forth electronically versus people manually having to enter that. And there's a, a lot of data that goes back and forth. We're improving data pre-population. We're streamlining the federal financial status report. So they might have to currently file in several different places, but when we, we're reducing that down to a single place, and then we're trying to automate that single place. And we're also working to promote a single sign-on across the uh, government. There's actually RAI that reached out to me and said, hey, uh, uh, we ought to be pursuing that. And so we're actually been in conversations with uh, a number of other agencies to have a single sign-on in one place that a grantee wouldn't have to have 20 passwords across all the grant agencies of this government, but would just have uh, one, and then all the grant systems, ours and others, would use that. Uh, same thing for grant tours with the reduced staff. They're looking to be more efficient. When you talked about earlier, they're looking to rethink the process so that they, they can eliminate a lot of the manual processes they do with automation. They're looking for advanced data integration with the external systems. And they're looking to manage data. Uh, they want to know how efficient we are. So our, our data says how much work a grant officer does, how much a division an officer or an agency does. And we'll see uh, agencies will come in and they'll have a big surge at the end of the year. And then we'll show them that data, and they'll realize that they're doing all their grant awards here, and they'll start developing strategies to flatten that down and move it across so they can get their grants done with substantially less staff. So people are able to manage internally when we give them visibility into all the information they have. Uh, having worked with several different agencies uh, that are considering shared services, one of the big obstacles always seems to be if I stop self-performing, whether it be my accounting services or my payroll or my data centers or presumably my grants, what am I going to do with all these staff? In fact, I'm kind of worried about these staff and I want to be a compassionate employer. So my question is, does the kind of the, the staff of an agency itself doing the work, does that inhibit folks from joining you because perhaps you may not need as many staff or any of their staff? How do you deal with that? We, we haven't seen a single partner that said, uh, gee, and the guy says, I don't have enough staff, or I have too much staff to do the work I have. They, they're always sort of overloaded, and they're all understaffed. I haven't ever seen a case where they need it. What we are able to do is actually move them to higher order work. So if they're doing administrative tasks now, now if we free up some of that time, they're able to say, well, and we talked about how do we identify fraud, how do we look for problems. They're able to start looking for risk and they're looking for opportunities to make things better. So Tony's never thinking, oh gee, I don't need these folks now. What he's always thinking is he has these innovative ideas of things he'd like to do and, uh, and he needs resources and staff to do it. So we're freeing them up for these higher order things that they have a passion to do. So we, we haven't seen that uh, you know, be a problem ever. Um, on this right here, uh, our partners have uh, had uh, uh, you know, visual data analytics for some time, but what they're asking us for is to make it more uh, user-friendly, improve the UI UX. Well, what we're finding is that uh, we need a lot, much larger market penetration. So they're asking us to make data presentable in the way we understand it. They're asking us to give them uh, uh, like uh, easy access to use uh, things like tools like Tableau, uh, Microsoft Click, even some that are really basic. Want to just go to pull the data out, understand what it is, and put it in Microsoft Excel. So while the complex systems have existed for a long time to do this, that complex systems are not what people want. What people want is something that's easy for them to, uh, to use and access. So measuring program outcomes, 
Um, we're trying to move from what gets spent into what's produced, and so that's data, not documents. So instead of getting paper or scanned documents, we're trying to collect data that we can analyze, and data from many sources. Like we uh, partnered uh, with uh, the Bill and the Gates Foundation and, and AI, USAID uh, to do some grants. And in that data we were looking at, uh, a pentabiomid uh, uh, vaccine cost $1. But when you look at other sources, you find that there's $44 of economic benefit. And in fact, uh, the vaccine rate uh, in, has now got to 86%. So what you find when you look into other sources of data is that 122 million children's lives have been saved. In other words, the fatality rate before the vaccine was at such a level that after the vaccine, 122 million children under the age of five, so their lives were saved. And so what you find is that if you can look at external sources of data, like we talked about audit data for fraud, uh, you may only have that, yes, I gave this many vaccines, but someone else will have that, that's $44 in economic benefit because people aren't staying home, missing work because children are sick. And it has a, uh, you know, the life-saving things, some other agencies will be collecting that information about the infant mortality. So you're able to merge all this data together and understand what the outcomes of the program. So you have the outputs, how many vaccines you gave, but these other sources will give you the outcomes. So we're applying emerging technologies. This was to your question, Kathy. What we have is, uh, we're running these machine learning analytics with Johns Hopkins, and we're finding that there's a lot of opportunities with the various sources of data to manage workloads, rethink evaluation, estimating ROI. So uh, it's the Johns Hopkins folks that are doing that work for us. And we haven't uh, operationalized this, but we're doing a lot of analysis and we see a lot of opportunity to operationalize this. But again, it goes primarily to external sources of data. We're not collecting the return on investment. We're, we're collecting as how many vaccines do we give, not how many children's lives. But that other information, whether it's audits or whether it's uh, children's life saved or something, that information is out there. And if you run a uh, AI by machine learning analysis against it and bring all this data together, you can go and census real data and find that you're giving grants to elderly that doesn't have a, a large elderly population. Maybe you didn't put them in Florida and you put them in Minnesota or something. Uh, so a lot of different sources of data can give you a lot of insight on how you should be doing a program and what that return on investment is. So, uh, so Michael, um, when it comes to um, uh, automation technologies like you know machine learning or AI, uh, there are sort of two concerns that uh, you know uh, the customers sometimes have. One is around uh, are people going to lose their jobs? And then Jeff um, asked that question, and he sort of advised it that you are moving them towards more high about the activities. But the second one is around. Um, that you know the pitfalls with this technology that would the human bias get injected in the machine learning and influence uh, things in sort of odd crazy ways. So when you when you're talking about rethinking application evaluation, could you sort of share some insights that do you feel like there's some risk of certain applications getting uh, you know promoted to the top because of all these algorithms that no one can understand? Um, well, as it turns out, uh, the grant committee is not like the contract committee in that they uh, are sort of a kinder and gentler version or something. And so they always want a person in the loop. And so uh, we can look at applications and we can pretty much tell the applications that are going to fail just by doing AI word searches on them. Uh, and again, it comes back to like we were talking about, if the travel is too high, then they're probably not a really serious grantee. They're just trying to get free travel money to go places and do things, you know. Uh, there's a whole host of things that you can find in, even by word matches. And so if you've seen those word things where they have uh, word uh, collage and has large words and small words. Uh, if you're doing uh, uh, a particular research and you don't see the right words in there that you would expect for that application, those are not the ones that are likely to be selected. So there's all kinds of processes that that are very analytic in nature that can tell you which applications are going to be without any kind of analysis on the application itself, but just some key features. Mm -hmm. Now, once you've done that, though, the grant community wouldn't be willing to accept that. But what they can do, instead of paneling the thing with, you know, five doctors to review all these grants, you could have one of them look at it and reconfirm that, yes, this was just a, a very poorly written uh, grant application. So it would probably be a two-step process one, you would have a, a single person reviewing these ones that you believe are bad, 
and then they could advance it on if it had any merit to it at all. Okay. Do you then um, take the, well, what you think might be indication of fraud to the relevant IG office in that agency? Um, uh, certainly if we find any fraud, we would immediately take it to the OIG. But typically what happens is your these are providing indicators, and so what happens is you go out and you find out why that's happening. Uh, and so this isn't a, a definitive, yes, there's something going on. What it is is an indicator. Like I said, with, with the travel thing, we use the example, maybe they live in Guam and they have to come back to the States for a conference or something like that. Uh, then you would expect that. So the to first step is just that the grants people in that agency start thinking about it before, and they would hand it over to an IG. They would hand it over to the IG. Yeah. So, in our model, what we are is a, a partner that helps people be successful with their okay. mission. And so, what we're doing is providing information that helps them make uh, good decisions. In some cases, in the small agencies, we'll do the entire process for them. And if Congress wants to know about something, we'll actually write the letter in response for them and do the whole process. But. And most of our agencies, that's not our role. Our role is to provide a, uh, uh, like a technology and, uh, and business services to help them execute their mission. Um, any questions on, uh, on this one? Uh, I have questions on online. A question from someone online. Uh, it might not be the right one for um, she wants to know um, about the cost of using the system. Uh, that's, that's sort of a, a funny question. Uh, I, I actually had a, a, an entire department, and, and uh, they were only paying three million dollars for the entire department. And every other system they had was uh, was costing them uh, tens of millions of dollars for any kind of department-wide system. And I went there and I talked to their their deputy secretary, uh, I, I, and he he says. Uh, and also went to talk to, I don't want to say the name, you know, was. And, and so what, what, what happened was, uh, he said, well, we're, we're not happy this uh, system costs so much money. I went, oh, wow. I, thought, I looked in your OMB reports and all the other ones cost uh, 10 times as much. Well, as so it turns out, the project person who was over that was charging each of the 24 bureaus about $3 million, at least some of them, and, and then take that all money to build another system they want to build. So they thought our money, our thing was like 10 times more than it was or something like yeah. that. So what we find when OMB analyzed our cost, uh, and, and they actually assigned us to be a national grant selection source, supported us on that, our costs were one seventh of one fifteenth of what other options were, uh, and that's primarily because of the collaboration while we're all working together, everyone's investing. So when you have fifteen hundred programs that are investing, if one of them puts a dollar in, you get fifteen hundred dollars of benefit. So that gives you a uh, an economies of scale. But that's not the real value. The real value is you have 1,500 smart people in a room, you know, helping you solve uh, solve uh, problems in, that you have. <clears throat> so I'll just uh, kind of dovetail off of that. So are you allowed to make a profit? Uh, I, I'm not allowed to, to make a profit. You know, so okay. So we are uh, whatever we collect actually goes to uh, you know our partners and. Uh, we've never, and I never raise our cost ever when someone joins 10 years ago, uh, other than the 1% inflation because we have to match the salaries and thing. Uh, the real value money never increased for any of our partners. We just, just don't increase it. So, so you give money back to your partners. But looking at new technologies, AI, et cetera, there's a, there's a cost to that, like a, a research and development cost. So would that be, first, any money that you have outside of your cost, would it go towards that or just give it back to the partners? Um, it, as it turns out, uh, we uh, don't, uh, we sort of think like Google things. Uh, the smart thing to do when you uh, have cost savings is not to give it back, it's actually to invest it. Because if I invest, well, suppose that you're a uh, person, I, I give you two options. I can either give you a dollar back or I can give you $1,500 more in value in something that you want. Uh, what would you like me to do? Right. So agencies don't have uh, money to spend more, but when they program a certain amount, they can afford that amount. And if every year uh, we can increase the value that we add to them, because new partners join and those new partners invest in new value, then for the same cost that they initially joined just 10 years ago, now they have several times the value that they had then, and they're still paying the same cost. So to them, that looks good. So a race to the bottom on cost and technology is always a poor choice. 
a race that, in fact, if they had less money, they should probably be investing more in technology because that lets them be more efficient. Uh, okay, one more question from online. Um, so, do you have interfaces with agency financial systems like SAP or Oracle? Uh, yes, we, we do. And, and uh, so, we, uh, Department of Transportation, for example, has a you know, real time Oracle financial interface. And those are typically done uh, with a proxy in the middle. So, we'll send like commitments and obligations and de obligations and so forth to the proxy. And then the proxy talks to the system, makes sure there's secure isolation between the two. Uh, State Department Momentum System, we're connected with that. Uh, we're working with Treasury ASAP to connect to their Oracle financial system right now for a couple of our department and, and smaller optic partners. Yes. Hi, Roman L. LCG. I just wanted to ask, we heard about all the benefits of the um, ACFC and we, what's holding the rest of the government back from using it? Well, I think the, the, the question they ask is, is nobody looks for a change until there's a, an external driver that has them have that change. And so they haven't encountered that external driver yet. And I'm not going around marketing. I, you know, I don't go talk. I, people, every partner we basically had sort of came and knocked on my door and go, hey, do you have a grant system? And in fact, funny story is they usually go to grants.gov. And they go, Grants like that, but do you also do grant applications? They go, no, that's not me, that's Michael Curtis. I should go talk to him. So nobody even knows that I do uh, grants for the most part, or probably went under the radar because, again, since we're not a private company, we're just uh, trying to deliver value to American people. And we uh, had uh, you know, people stand in line to join. We just never really sought out them. Although this year here, we've actually uh, have sort of an outreach team that we brought on board in the last year to actually help us with outreach because I'm an engineer, I just try to build things that are useful, but people say, no, no, you actually have to have a message and get out there and tell people. Thank you. Um, but I'm curious, uh, I believe the COA doesn't have any appropriation, right, that funds its um, operations. So uh, do you see any uh, opportunity in leveraging the management act, given that it is for IT modernization and so have used that for innovations? Um, the, the reason that that, uh, that we've been very successful in the, in the grants for excellence is we have not had any top-down money. There are a number of shared services that were given tens of millions of dollars that uh, had a lot of uh, bureaucracy I had to do for that resource and then ended up not being successful. We took zero money from anybody uh, and we built it from the ground up. And what that allows you to do is to have the agility to get things done for your partner. So you talked about do we return money? No, but we never increase cost. And so I, I, the, the, the partnership, uh, because it's very collaborative, uh, keeps growing and that growing keeps adding value. And so I think that's a much better model uh, adding value from the ground up than you are, you know, uh, taking money from the top down. Now, if other people want to do that, certainly not, they certainly should. But for us, that isn't where we got value from. We got value from collaborating with, from the grassroots, not uh, not from the from the top down. And of course, we're 100% compliant with all the government requirements, and we'll be in the, the list of uh, legislation. Uh, so we're we're certainly sensitive to that. And uh, I met with the Deputy Director of OMB last month and sort of laid out our strategy and what we're trying to do. And they were supportive of what we're trying to do. So I don't want to say that we're not 100% behind them taking that direction we are. But in terms of the operational decisions that we make, we try and have our partners uh, drive us. And so that's why we take the funding from partners. And as soon as you uh, take the King's coin, you, you have to do the King's bidding, whatever group that happens to be. Uh, King's coin brings to mind my question, which is you have kind of 535 members of Congress overseeing you, OMB overseeing you. My presumption is actually that as you talk about partners, there's some sort of governance model where the partners oversee you as well. And I guess my question is, you know, with, with the, the number of partners you have, how do you maintain consistency and focus? You know, a lot of private organizations, they have maybe five or seven board members. They don't have like 20 or 30. Well, well uh, strangely enough, uh, we have trouble getting people to govern, you know. Uh, and, and so, and, and the reason that is, is it, and I was talking to Dave, he's the deputy CFO for, uh, for CDC, he goes, you know, you, my other grant services, people keep walking to my office and tell me, or my other shared services, people walk in my office and tell me the problem they have with them. He says, no one walks in my office and tells me about the problem I have with you. So when he has a very full schedule and he has to go to a meeting, 
which being his go-to, and someone that wants to double his cost or isn't giving him service, I actually have to go down to CDC, which we just did last month, in order to talk to him, because he doesn't want to come up, uh, you know, and, well, he, Dave's pretty good about coming, but people generally don't want to come because everything's working fine. I'm not ever raising the cost and delivering more value every year, uh, and so we actually have to go get people to, to come eat. But we do have the whole government. So we have a grants executive board, which serves as our board of directors. We have users groups that we meet up here and get input. Uh, I go out and talk to every executive partner and a round robin type thing to understand what they need. We have a mid-level managers go out and talk to the partners. And then we have uh, what we call PPDs. So every partner has a partner project director that uh, meets with them on a regular basis to make sure they understand what their needs are. So our governance is somewhat like a a private company in the sense that people purchase in that three circle like whatever service they want immediately. So I don't vote that they can have something or not have something. Uh, I implement those things that are required, you know, by legislation and whatnot, and then partners decide what they want to fund. So rather than, than me taxing all the partners and then say, okay, how are we going to govern how I tax you the money? I don't tax anybody. They either voluntarily want to invest or they don't. And I think that makes us make good decisions. So we don't do anything that they don't want us to do because we have no appropriated funds. So if I taxed or had appropriated funds, then I would maybe need more government governments. But since, uh, and, and I have the governments, but they, they don't really have any tax or any appropriated funds to vote. So what are they voting on? They're voting on, do I want to invest my dollars in this new service or not? Any more questions? Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, and I, oh, please go ahead. I'm actually relaying a quest. Uh, so, what is the, in your opinion, the future for grants management in terms of the next steps, not only just for the ACFCOE, but also in, in general for grants? Um, what we're going to do is be integrating much more than we've been integrating in the past. And so we're integrating with payment systems so that people only have to file in one place. We're integrating with financial systems. We're integrating with uh, more with uh, grants.gov. Um, with NIH, for example, where uh, we had a uh, system that they required for announcements. And so we're building a single announcement system and partnering with them. Uh, CDC had some uh, biomedical researchers that wanted to use the program system that NIH had and brought that back. Grants.gov had, had wanted to do a forecast system, and we had a forecast system, and we transferred all that information and, and business over to Grants.gov because we thought that ought to be a national capability with fine. And so I think the future model is that there's a lot more cross-collaboration. So we would work with USDA, we'll work with Treasury, we'll work with all these different systems to, to give a grantee and the public a single uh, user interface that's an automated user interface away from sort of plethora of, uh, of type of interfaces they have to deal with. So I think it's, it's integration and collaboration between all the different operations is, is what the next generation is. And of course the grantee, grantor, program and stuff is on. Yes? There's a lot of discussion of uh, working with the federal agencies uh, as collaborators. Uh, as far as working with grant applicants and grant recipients, uh, what sort of uh, work do you guys do to ensure that access is available to not just university uh, applicants and recipients, but also uh, small nonprofits, uh, mom and pop shops, uh, like you know, uh, we were talking about uh, SBIR earlier this uh, this afternoon. Um, you know, what what are you doing to make sure that uh, even people with limited capabilities can access this system. Um, it, it, it's a very real problem. I, mean, I know it's a funny story. We actually have somebody that rides a yak to a local library to get on the internet to actually access our system. So not everybody is MIT or something like that. We definitely have, have a problem base. Uh, there, of course, is the standard uh, venues that you go to the FTP, and we attend the Bill and the Gates Foundation where they bring the grantees in to work about those issues. Uh, in the government structure, I can't uh, go out and just ask grantees, what are you thinking? There are all kinds of regulations about surveys and whatnot. I get more than nine. Um, what we do is we have programs that deal primarily with the grantees directly. So each program can go out and ask nine grantees what they think because they have a relationship with them or something. So we typically work through the programs who have a passion for serving the grantees and have a close relationship with them. 
and they provide us the feedback from the grantees. We of course talked to a few grantees, but because the programs primarily want to manage that relationship, and there's a limit to how many I can do without uh, you know, six months of approval to talk to 20 grantees or something like that, we, we have to sort of do it through the, the program office for the most part, or the, the national forms that we have. Just real quick, from a, from a capability, I'm not sure who asked this question, from a capabilities perspective, so I, I totally get the point, right? You've got folks that either have solid internet connection and go in there and go in, and I believe that's where you were going. So to that point, something that Michael said in terms of augmenting staff and giving people the access to the system to make sure that just because they can't get on the internet on that particular day or they're connected, whatever it may be, that they're not going to be sort of eliminated from that competition. You do have the ability to take those paper applications, all of that documentation, we can get that into the system from a paper-based level. So there's nobody that's going to be kind of removed based on a technical limitation. Thank you. Michael, I'm curious, you mentioned the Gates Foundation once or twice, and you've got clearly a strong capability of helping administer grants. Do you have any partners who are not government agencies, for example, nonprofits, or maybe a, a government in another country? We, we, we have not uh, went that way uh, for various reasons. And again, <coughs> when you're the federal government, uh, you don't have to set the latitude to uh, partner and deal in uh, other types of areas. And so we have talked to the states some. Uh, Jerry Frederick used to head up the Grants Executive Board, which is the governance board uh, for all of the grants in the U.S. He became the uh, CIO of North Carolina. He goes, hey, can you provide your system to us? And, and we went down that conversation with, uh, with him, and we couldn't really see a way to make that work for us, you know? So we weren't uh, against the concept, but when you start looking at the practical execution of it, it didn't actually work for us. And, and I think we actually had looked at uh, using Salesforce at one point in time to actually you know, provide a service to, uh, to the states and that sort of thing, and uh, we didn't have a model to support that. And we think other people have later been successful with that model. Uh, so we think that's a, a service that somebody ought to provide. It probably is not a service that, that we would provide any time in the near future. I was just wondering if states could go with, for example, could they get data from you on all the money from all the grants, at least the ones that you cover, that are going into a state or, or a city? Well, that's what we're uh, working to do, is to find uh, the other side where we had electronic uh, data feeds of those. And so they can get that in emails and paper and stuff like that. Uh, and there's, on USA Spending has some, but uh, what we're trying to do is to find those national standards uh, so that we can send all these files electronically. So even as an electronic system, we no longer have to enter them one after another after another, but they'll be able to just have an automated feed that does that. So we're, we think we'll have that uh, in the next year. So Michael, you and I, as we were preparing for this, had a brief chat. And my theory is that, for example, in the market for commercial airlines, I might prefer to fly Southwest because they don't charge baggage fees and they have friendly people. Someone else might prefer to fly Spirit because they're just a low-cost provider. And we all kind of recognize, you know, there are three or four or five big airlines and maybe a total of ten in the market. It, it strikes me that in the kind of grant system, shared services marketplace in the U.S. federal government, there's been this kind of organic evolution of organizations like yours that have just kind of grown up from demand. No one's ever kind of, to my knowledge, taken a look at the whole marketplace and said, you know, here's the low cost provider, here's the high service provider, here's the one that focuses on competitive grants, here's the one that's best at block grants and most economical. And so I guess my question is, do you see kind of a market like that evolving where there's some really distinct differentiations and choices, but still not kind of, you know, 500 choices that might be too confusing? Uh, th there are very different market segments. Um, and uh, what we didn't do very well initially was we didn't serve the smaller grant team very well. So if a person didn't have a certain number of grants, we, we basically said, you know, if you have 50 grants, maybe it doesn't make sense to use the system. Uh, you might draw off an Excel or 3 by 5 card or something because <laughs> the, the cost of the system and training and whatnot wouldn't be worth it for you. But then these same individuals, they have to file with USA Spend, and our system automatically does that for them. And so if they had to do all that work, it ended up costing them more labor than a cost of our system. So we pondered that, and given we weren't structured to do that, we partnered with the Denali Commission. And they're a small um, agency in Alaska that gives uh, grants to the uh, Alaska and Alaska Natives and rural areas and that type of thing. 
And so what they do is if a small grantee, like the Consumer Body Safety Commission has five grants to do, so Congress gives them money to do a particular grant, they don't have a grant office, they don't have processes, they don't necessarily have the money to, to buy a full up grant system uh, because they have five grants. But if they had to hire consultants and are going to figure out all the processes that are legally required, it would end up costing hundreds of thousands of dollars to do all analysis. And so the Penale Commission go in there, do that entire process for them, you know, for much less than we would charge a regular grant agency to, to use our system. So we've actually, we're not capable, I, Michael Burris and, and team, we're not capable of providing that service for the small grantee. So we partnered with somebody that does that very well. So you're the wholesaler and the Denali Commission is the retailer for small agencies. We, we, we are, and, and we, we cross-sell the, uh, the NIH uh, biomedical research thing for program offices, you know. So the point is we, we collaborate with everybody. Uh, so Michael Curtis makes sure that everyone's mission gets filled, but Michael Curtis doesn't do it. I go find someone that's smarter than I about the particular area, and then they actually do that partnership with him. Uh, any other questions? Um, um, so Michael, uh, do you, I mean, you know, you are, you have sort of like a really unique sort of plans platform. Are you able to envision opportunities to open it up so that uh, uh, we can sort of replicate the models that uh, uh, were as part of the app store in, uh, let's say, the Apple's ecosystem or the app exchange in the Salesforce ecosystem, where, you know, you can open the data, open the APIs so that, uh, you know, the, 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 the private sector can contribute apps into your platform so that you know uh, the grantees and the grantors can sort of benefit from uh, that kind of approach um we we had of course looked at the sales force to actually do that type of thing with them and make that like a public thing that we would all work on together um uh, th there were different reasons why that didn't work for us you know one of the reasons is, is that we wanted to own the uh, the product that we had so otherwise if i want to negotiate with an agency I can't promise their costs won't increase and so forth because I'm tied to a uh, particular tool or something like that, but we think that the concept's very valid. And, and how we try to address that is we have standard interfaces where if someone's providing a particular service, we'll be providing data in standard ways to them and receiving data from them in standard ways. And so it's not uh, exactly like, but it does allow uh, all these other entities to have an operation uh, that, that interface with ours and, and they provide services. And so in the case of REI, for example, uh, we're working to provide the same data to REI that we're providing to uh, MIT and others in standard formats. And with that data being made available, then you're able to offer automated services to your, your customers and that sort of thing. So we're working to share the information back and forth, uh, but we didn't actually stand up a shared uh, capability like Apple or something like that. Because when we look at the business model, we didn't know how to make that, uh, that work for us. All right, well, Michael, I wanted to thank you very much for sharing your experience and uh, information about success that you've had. Uh, we really appreciate your coming. Very nice to have you. And, uh,